hymn number 680 is our last hymn for before the service of uh, the sermon, so I'll return there, please. And I think this is going to be a little bit new to me, and uh, I've heard it before, but I wonder if we could just play that through just one time. page 685 in your hymn book, but I'll give you the text and then the hymn book, the piano will play through this. When my way seems dark and drear and the future I don't know, my heart feels so empty as the tears unending flow. When my heart 
breaks with sorrow, and the tempest fills my soul, this one thing I know for sure, my God is in control. When the toils of life are come and my heart is worn with care, I faint beneath the burden of a cross I cannot bear. When the joy has departed from my sorrow-stricken soul, this one thing I know for sure, God is in control. His way is perfect. Though I don't understand his wise and loving plan, his way is perfect. My prayer, take my life and make a vessel purified. Because God makes no mistakes, his way is best. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. I'll read the first 14 verses. I would invite you in honor of God's word if you would are able to please stand with me as I read this text. <clears throat> please follow along in your Bibles as I read from the New King James Version, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14. Now the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month 
shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. Ye shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus ye shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt, on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word, and through your word for giving us this remembrance of the Passover. And I pray now, God, that as I share some thoughts that you have laid upon my heart with your people, that you would minister to our needs and draw us closer to yourself. Impress upon us, O Lord, the need to walk closely by your side. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we anticipate coming up at the end of the month of March, the, the annual remembrance and celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I have come up with three uh, subjects that will, that will prevail over the next three, this week and the next two Sundays, bringing us up to that Resurrection Sunday that many in the world call Easter Sunday. We have three subjects to consider then, and I will give you the first one today. It's called the pre-Passover preparations. Next Sunday, we'll talk about the Passover itself, thinking more specifically of the night in which he was betrayed. And then following that, we have the post-Passover subject of the resurrection itself. That will bring us right up to the end of March. So today we're talking about the pre-Passover preparations. And within the subject of the preparations that are made for the Passover, I want to give you these three. You know, it sounds like I've really turned a leaf on homiletically correct three-point messages here. A three-point series with a three-point message I assure you that's purely by coincidence, not by my care and, and the quality of studies. But I do have three 
considerations regarding the preparations for the Passover. And I believe they will bear well on our consideration of Resurrection Sunday when it comes about. First of all, there is the anticipation. And then there is the subject of perfection. And then there is the subject of remembrance. Anticipation as we begin the text in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. We have the consideration of a, a new calendar. They were told that this was a, a new way of counting their time. This was to be this, uh, counting their time. This was to be a new month. The beginning of months. The first month in the year. And from verse 3 on the 10th day of this first month was to be a special day. It was to be an annual event. Just like we have many annual events, a couple of which we just uh, sang about earlier this morning and as we uh, celebrated a couple of birthdays coming up this week. These are annual events. Many folks look forward to birthdays. I have heard of a few that would rather look the other way, but guess what? Birthdays come. Wedding days. I will always <clears throat> remember back to a specific day in 1985 when my wife and I got married. That was a special day. We continue to remember that special day every year with greater or lesser uh, success, perhaps, but it is a day to be remembered. How about when you were going through when you were still in school and you came up to uh, this time of year when there was a spring break. Or even better yet, as we get closer to the end of May and into June, there was a special day called School is Out Day, the last day of school. It came every year, right about the middle of June, when you're in grade school, I guess, higher levels get out at different times but I remember looking forward to that day every year yes this is our last day of school and you know as a student going into this last day of school there's just no possible way they're going to try to teach you anything because you've already made up your mind that you're done from the teacher's perspective everything has been graded and passed out and returned and they're not about to go into trying to teach anything further either but those were those special days, days that you remember, even days that you anticipate. The Israelites were to look forward to this Passover feast that was being instituted. They were to look forward to this every year. And in fact, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 22, verses 15 and 16, Jesus himself anticipated this Passover feast. I suppose in the Old Testament as they went through, they were to look forward to this feast with joy. Jesus in Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 15 and verse 16, it says, Jesus said to his disciples as he sat with them regarding this last Passover meal. He says with with desire or with fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer the reason for his desire and for his joy of anticipation despising the shame of the cross was to look forward to that day he says when I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. As Jesus approached this Passover feast, all of the Jews, all of the descendants of the Israelites were continuing to celebrate the Passover as a, a joyful feast. Jesus was trying to teach his disciples that this particular 
Passover feast was going to be fulfilled in his own death on the cross as that sacrificial lamb. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Jesus was anticipating this feast. But Jesus was anticipating this Passover feast as it represented his own coming to the cross. Where Jesus would pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus was looking forward to the fulfillment of this Passover feast in the kingdom of God when once again Jesus says he said he will partake of this ordinance given to the church as the Lord's Supper Jesus will partake of this feast again in the kingdom of God when the kingdom of God is fulfilled and that of course gets into eschatology in the book of Revelation and all that stuff but that is the anticipation of the Passover feast. There is also the perfection of the Passover feast. As we read in Exodus 12 and verse 5, we were told, Your lamb shall be without blemish. And in fact, they were instructed to select their lamb and to keep it aside for four days. Keeping that one special lamb that they had decided that was supposed to be their perfect lamb, they were to keep it aside for four days, isolating it so that, I suppose, so that nothing would happen to it. But also for the continued and further inspection to make sure that this was, in fact, a perfect lamb. Why was it so important? that the lamb be perfect. Well, this lamb was part of the sacrifices to God. God had established or was establishing the sacrifices. And as we might read in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8, if you were to offer a lame or a blind animal as a sacrifice to your governor, do you think he would be pleased with such a gift? Well, I can understand in the minds of the Israelites if they have a flock of lambs and a lamb was blemished and not really good for much of anything. <coughs> and if in the presentation of this lamb as a sacrifice, they were just going to kill it and burn the whole thing on the altar anyways, what difference does it make whether it's blind or lame? God had a specific purpose in making sure that the lamb that they chose was a perfect, without blemish lamb that was offered to God for this <coughs> sacrifice as they celebrated the feast of the Passover. Jesus, in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, is identified as the perfect, sinless sacrifice that was anticipated by the spotless Passover lamb. The lamb chosen for the Passover feast was to be spotless because it anticipated the perfection of Jesus Christ, who was the only sinless, therefore qualified human being, though he was God himself. This is what qualified him in his humanity to be the sinless sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the only one who could offer himself to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice, and thus, as Jesus anticipated this particular event, he was anticipating not the sacrifice of a lamb for the sake of uh, celebrating and eating it together, but no, he was anticipating the sacrifice of himself, the perfect lamb. 
Then we have the concept of remembrance. Where Moses was told and Moses was telling the people of Israel, this day shall be to you a memorial throughout your generations, an everlasting ordinance. In the King James it says, Ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. It says, In this day I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, he said this while they were still in the land of Egypt. He had not yet brought them out of the land. The New King James, the way it is put together in the text, puts it this way. On this same day, I will have brought your armies out. Looking at that future concept of looking back in remembrance. I'm not sure what kind of what kind of tense or parts of speech that we're talking about. That's for the English majors to worry about. But he's talking about in the future looking back. He says, I will have brought your armies out of Egypt. That is, they were anticipating in the future looking back on the perfect sacrifice and remembering how God had delivered them or will have had delivered them in the future. Jesus had at the Last Supper with his disciples. Jesus did not push the subject of remembrance. At that time, I imagine the men were in no position to process the consideration that they will have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. He was trying to tell his disciples that he was going to the cross. He was going to be killed. He was trying to teach his disciples that he was going to be killed on the cross, but three days later would rise again. They couldn't understand that much. So for Jesus to be able to say, this is going to be something that you will remember me by, it, it was over their heads. That's, and that's why as we go through the ordinance of the Lord's table on each first Sunday of the month when we celebrate that ordinance, we have turned many times to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul, after the fact, after Christ had been crucified and risen again and ascended into heaven, Paul reminds us of the instructions that they were given. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, he says, I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Can you imagine Paul trying to preach this to the disciples even before Christ was crucified? It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense until it is considered in the context of Jesus Christ having gone to the cross, having paid our penalty so that we could have his righteousness. The church is to continue to do this in remembrance of me. As Jesus said, 
It is a means of proclaiming Jesus' death until he comes back to catch us away. So we understand now the anticipation of the Passover feast. We understand the perfection of the lamb required. And now we understand the remembrance of the deliverance that God had brought about. For the nation of Israel, it was a deliverance from their bondage in the land of Egypt. But throughout the scriptures, that has been given to us as an example of our deliverance from our bondage to sin through the blood of Christ as he was sacrificed on the cross. Jesus knew what he was about to go through. Jesus knew in anticipation what it would take to accomplish as this, uh, and to accomplish this mission that involved going to the cross. I have on occasion dabbled in just briefly going into some of the uh, recent news on the wars in Israel and in Russia. And on occasion, I get that sense of wondering just what do some of these prisoners of war go through? I'm not suggesting that you do so unless you're prepared for the truth. There's a reason why those who come home from service won't talk about the scenes on the war, in the war zones. What you see and hear on the front line of the media that's available to you, I assure you is very politically motivated and geared towards what society would like to accomplish. It has nothing to do at all with what's really going on behind the scenes. And that is just a touch of what Jesus knew that he was going to go through in order to provide himself as the sacrifice that would take our place so that we would not face the judgments of God, but that we could have eternal life. When you understand what Jesus went through to provide himself as the place where we can come and be accepted before God and receive his mercy and forgiveness, that is what Jesus accomplished. Jesus provided himself as a propitiation. That means the specifically referring to the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. It was the place where God had designed the nation of Israel through their priests to be able to come and be accepted before God with blood before the mercy seat. Jesus provided himself as that mercy seat through whom we can come by simply believing that he is that perfect sacrifice, that he took our sin upon himself. There is nothing that we could have done to provide even a part of that sacrifice on our own. There is no value in ourselves. There's nothing that we could do, nothing that we could credit of ourselves. There's no trying to do good and trying to do the best that we can. None of that is going to accomplish anything to obtain our mercy and forgiveness. It is all about what Jesus himself has done. And when you understand what Jesus went through to provide to us his mercy and forgiveness, how can we turn him down by saying, I've got this, God, I don't need. 
you know, how can anyone turn God aside and say, I don't need you. I've got this. I do pretty good. I'm on my way. I, I, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I'm doing the best I can to live my life the way I ought to be. That does not, that does not provide mercy and forgiveness. What provides mercy and forgiveness is our coming to Jesus Christ as the only place where we can find mercy of God and saying, I believe in you, Jesus, I believe you died for my sin and I receive your gift of mercy and forgiveness. Then we can pray, God, please help me to do the best I can because of what you have done to give me your righteousness. If that speaks to you this morning and you recognize your need to come to Jesus Christ and receive his mercy and forgiveness, have not, having done so in the past, I would encourage you to talk to me after the service is over or by way of our YouTube channel. You can find our, our webpage, AugustaBaptist.org, and connect to Connect with us that way. Talk to me. Talk to another who you understand to be a believer in Christ to help you understand, if necessary, what you need to do to obtain God's mercy and forgiveness. It's all about coming to Christ and saying, Lord, you've done it all. I believe you died for my sin. Please forgive me and give me your eternal life that you promised. And he will do that. For God so loved the world by raising his son on a cross, the way Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Nobody likes the concept of being judged in hell should not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for this reminder that the anticipation of the Passover, the anticipation of what we celebrate on Easter Sunday morning, being the Passover, uh, the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb, and we thank you, God, that as we anticipate this, we can remember what you have done to grant, to bring to us our salvation. And I would certainly pray for those who have not received your mercy and forgiveness that they will call upon your name today, that they would come to you, Jesus Christ, and claim the promise that you have given to us of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to take your hymn book to number 399. 399 is a hymn of decision. In fact, it's a hymn of a decision made in the past. I hope you have made that decision. If you have not made that decision, that is the most important decision you'll ever make. I wish you would talk to me and connect with me somehow. We can make sure that that decision is made in your life. Let's stand together as we sing all three verses. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided.
looking back is not so much a part of our decision, but it is a recognition that turning back from following Jesus Christ is just not an option. May the Lord go with you as you go through this day. May he bless you along the way, and may he help you to be a blessing to others, seeking in every opportunity to point others to Jesus Christ. Thank you.